Welcome to the Real Life Resilience Podcast. Stories of recovery from life's most difficult trauma with Stacey Brookman. The hippie movement in full swing. We're talking about naked people dancing everywhere, literally. That whole cult moved to one of the top 10 most violent cities in the U.S. It took me a long, long time to wrap my head around that. The book writing process was the single biggest healing and transformational thing I've ever engaged in. Hey guys, this is Stacy, and I'm glad you're listening to Real Life Resilience, the podcast with stories of real people who have gone through real tough situations. Today's guest, Manny Wolf, was born into a new age cult in San Francisco in 1967. At eight years old, he was moved to the center of one of the 10 most violent cities in America. Now, he is the embodiment of someone who has come through the fire and emerged a better person. You're going to hear how he did it. But before we dive in, I'd like to take 30 seconds to share something that may change your life. You've always been a strong person, stronger than you realize, actually. But sometimes, thinking about the past unearths emotions and memories that are painful. Let us take you step by step through discovering your life story and the wisdom and healing power that it holds. Register now for Stacy's next free webinar where she reveals the four simple, proven methods to writing the first chapter of your life story this week. Simply click on the link in the show notes or head to stacybrookman.com slash webinar. I love to hear from listeners personally and I answer my own emails. So drop me a line and let me know what you found interesting in this episode or to ask me a question. My email is stacy at stacybrookman.com. Now let's welcome Manny Wolf. I was born into a cult, and one of the things that was very intense for me was there was heavy, heavy brainwashing about money being the primary instrument of Satan. When I was eight or nine years old, that whole commune slash cult up and moved without any explanation to the middle of the one of the top 10 most violent cities in the US anybody who knows anything about hippies knows that they're not violent by nature i never got any kind of a reasonable explanation as to why we would do such a such a wildly self-destructive thing but we're talking about 50 or 60 people pulling into an extremely violent ghetto in big buses and campers with slogans painted on the sides and flying saucers and just, <laughs> just targets basically targets. right i love it that's perfect i'm going <laughs> to use that yeah so we pulled in with targets painted all over our vehicle right <laughs> go from the corner of hate ashbury the hippie movement in full swing we're talking about naked people dancing everywhere literally that that that, that happened <laughs> for those of you that don't know. right <laughs> uh we're just talking about all of that stuff and then just boom right into this incredibly violent city and and literally the center of the worst neighborhood in the city so my life for 4 years became fighting every day all the time I felt looking back like I never was even able to catch my breath to figure out why I was so hated. So now I've got this strongly countercultural brainwashing set in and four years of intense violence. And the strangest part, Stacy, was that we, me and the other children, we were never protected. That's the part that I struggled with the most. I get that sometimes kids fight while they're, when they're kids. Right. They don't typically fight like I did, but to never be protected by the adults who were supposed to be in charge of us, it took me a long, long time to wrap my head around that. So by the time we finally moved out of that neighborhood and into a still not what I'd call safe, but much safer neighborhood, I kind of was shot like out of a cannon. I mean, I was just hitting puberty I had already been exposed to doing drugs and things like that because that was part of the commune as well. My mother still con uh, continued the pattern of no real supervision. And so now I have friends. I am interested in girls. I am actively doing drugs and I have no parental supervision. And I'm about 13. 
And your father is gone at this point, right? He's he's not been in your life. Yes, so no father to speak of. The picture that I want to paint here is one of criminal activity and violence, childhood and young adulthood, having had no guidance and no real moral or ethical center. I just ran after all the drugs, all the alcohol, all the girls, and just looked to whatever older role models would have me. And so by the time I was in my 20s, I would characterize myself as very lucky in the sense that I didn't go to jail a lot or right away, but I was definitely, definitely a criminal. By six years in, I had found all the criminals, and my experience culminated with me being homeless, completely strung out on methamphetamines, having just gotten out of jail for the second time, only to find that all of my things had been stolen, everything. Right. And then I found out who did it. And next thing I know, I'm standing out in front of my friend's apartment at about 9 p.m., November 23rd. He and I are holding two untraceable handguns. And I, I just remember so clearly looking and seeing the serial number filed off. That was a new low for me. Right. And he's making a plan with me about coming back at midnight hunting this other guy down, and shooting him. So externally, I'm a complete mask. I'm saying, okay, let's do this. I'm there. Meet me here at midnight. Internally, I had this experience of my the whole illusion that needed to exist for that life to be real just came crashing down like it was made out of glass. And I'll never forget that feeling because that is exactly what it was like. It was like... My reality was made out of glass, and someone threw a rock through it. And I just let go of the whole thing all at once in what alcoholics refer to as a moment of clarity. Wow. I knew I was never going to go hunt anybody down. You know, not for that. I knew that I had to fool this guy, because if I showed weakness in that moment, I could wind up on the wrong end of this guy's hunting party. Right. He had always been somewhat of a good friend, but I know the mentality of these guys. And you don't show weakness to those people. So I, you know, looked him in the eye and I said, let's do this. As soon as he left, I got on the phone. And within an hour, I was getting a ride back to Stockton where my mom lived. Two small boxes of belongings. That's all I had cobbled together. The clothes on my back. And I'm in the back of a CRX with two girls who I didn't know, leaving that life for good. And so that was the beginning of the transformation. That was the beginning of becoming who I now am. Well, describe describe your life now so we can see that contrast. The contrast. Now, my highest ideals are to be of service. I have a beautiful son who is going to turn 14 and has not yet broken a law. He hasn't been in over 200 fistfights yet, uh, so I consider that a win. And I'm attentive to his life. I'm involved. He is everything that I wasn't and that I possibly could have been if I had had a good parent or two. Right. I have a wonderful fiancé and... Her daughter is also part of our life, and so I have two children after a fashion. And then I also am able to step in and set a good example for the younger siblings of my son who who have the same mother but a different father. And so in a little bit more of an extended way, I actually am a positive influence for four children. Wow. That alone is so meaningful it it gives it fills me with so much purpose and joy and more than that though here's the thing okay and because i know that we're really talking about or leading up to the writing of my memoirs i went through most of my life thinking that i was somehow in some sort of weird cosmic joke i even though i wanted to be quote a good person that i was just destined to be a blight on society i mean I really felt that. I really believed that in the core of my being. I believed that some of the things that had happened to me were unable to be fixed. So to be able to set a good example for all of these children, 
it does sometimes uh, bring a tear to my eye. It's beyond my wildest dreams. And so to be able to do more than that, to be able to reach out and be a positive influence for other people is delirious. I mean, sometimes I just don't believe it's real. So that's my life today. I'm an example that if you want it bad enough, you can have it. You can do it. There's nothing that can't be undone. So Manny, early on, your life was a struggle of just trying to live, right? Trying to survive in that environment. And then once that that trigger happened, it was a struggle of changing Mm. yourself from the inside out. Yes. Tell us about that, because that had to be almost as great a struggle as the survival, is changing yourself. It was harder. It was harder, but not in a life-threatening way. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. But I became committed right away. So the first thing I did when I got back to Stockton was I jumped right into Alcoholics Anonymous. And I would have jumped into whatever you gave me if you told me that it could help me. It could have been (laughs) the most far-fetched thing imaginable. I would have subscribed to anything at that point. Right. So I get introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, here for the first time ever, and it's weird to me looking back to say this, but I was just about to turn 28, and I had never heard people speaking positively before. You know, I had never seen that. I had never been exposed to the idea, for instance, in the 12-step programs, they don't tell you what to do. They suggest what might work. So that little paradigm shift allowed me to sidestep my own huge ego, my own just tremendous sense of like over-exaggerated self-confidence, which was, of course, hiding this terrified, desperate child. It was my first exposure to an organized set of spiritual tools. And, you know, they have this saying in the program that you must take to this like a drowning man takes to a life preserver. Well, that is exactly what I did. Three meetings a day, four meetings a day for the first maybe year and a half, you know, (laughs) reading the books, the literature over and over and over again. I estimate because I just read it start to finish, start to finish, start to finish with no breaks. I -hmm. estimate that I read the two main books of of Alcoholics Anonymous about 400 times each. Wow. I I was whatever was going to work. I was going to do it. I wasn't going back to that life. It took easily five years before I slept okay, because I keep going back to the memory of talking about hunting down and shooting that guy. And I didn't even realize it at the moment, but I mean, that imprinted me. That was powerful because I was on the cusp. And then there were all these like storybook moments in my recovery. Like, for instance, I got a public defender because I had to go to court. Because one of the things you have to do is you have to clean up the wreckage of your past. And so in going to court, I got arrested initially while under the influence of methamphetamines. But I had to answer for that. And so I go to court and the court system was so inept that it literally saved me from a horrible fate, (laughs) their ineptitude. And here's how that worked. They gave me the same public defender that they gave the girl I was arrested with. That's a conflict of interest. It's against the law. And so I got up to my sentencing. My public defender, who was utterly incompetent, stands up before the judge and he says, Your Honor, this man has never before been arrested for anything like this. This is his first time. We ask that you show leniency. The judge didn't even look up. He said, Leniency denied 24 months in San Quentin. Oh, whacked his little gavel down. And you know what the public defender did? So, okay, sounds good to me. He literally, literally said, okay, sounds good to me. (laughs) So, needless to say, I'm a little stressed out at that moment. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And as the bailiff is taking the file back from the judge to put it somewhere, I don't even know where, he looks down and he says, your honor, He, being the most observant of all of them in the courtroom, says there seems to be a conflict of interest here. This public defender is also representing the girl that this man, uh, Mr. Wolf, was arrested with. 
The judge looks up, takes his glasses off, mops his forehead, sighs. <laughs> this is all true. <laughs> looks at the public defender and kind of, you know, wilts a little bit like, really, again? <laughs> and he says, My goodness. he says, okay, this case is held over until we can get this young man a new public defender. I was on the cusp. I, they were walking up to take me when this was all said. Right. Boom, there's a reprieve, right? I get this new public defender and I'm scared. I'm just so scared. This was weeks later and I had been going to my meetings. And so I tell this guy, I'm terrified. I don't belong in San Quentin, you know, and I've been going to AA. And he goes, oh, hold on. You've been going to, to AA meetings? I said, yes. He said, well, if you've been going to AA meetings, what are the first three steps? And I got to like step nine before he stopped me. I said, okay, okay, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then he pulls on a chain necklace and pulls out a medallion with 10 years sobriety on it. Oh, wow. So that was the second in what would prove to be just a series of miraculous things. I do want to paint a picture for you of the second time I went to court, backed by this new public defender. I'm in court. Everybody gets called and sentenced or set, whatever happens, right? Now, court ends at 5 o'clock. It is now 545. The judge is clearly irritable. Literally, my public defender, me, the bailiff, the stenographer, and the judge. No one else in the courtroom. This is how long it has taken. Everybody else was gone. Everyone else was gone. We finally get up to me, right? And my uh, public defender goes up to plead my case. And he says, Your Honor, this young man has shown extraordinary commitment to the 12 steps. He is dedicated to turning his life around. I completely believe that, given that he has no priors. I ask that you show leniency and grant him time served with probation. The judge says, nope, 24 months in San Quentin, slams the mm. gavel down. So at this moment, I figure to myself, there's no way lightning strikes twice. Right. I fall to my knees right there. And picturesquely, I fall to my knees right in the middle of the natural, <laughs> I'm not a religious man, the natural mm. cross formed by the walkway up to the judge's desk and the two side flanks i'm like right there in the middle of the cross the 545 sunlight is coming through the window it's hitting me as i'm there kneeling and praying to a god i have never seen before and do not believe in my public defender says again i have to insist that you show leniency wow the judge says again absolutely not Slams his gavel down and says 24 months. Now, I'm going to fast forward you to the end of this, but I want you to know that they went back and forth maybe 10 times, and my public defender actually raised his voice at the judge. Amazing. I am sitting there kneeling. I am crying. I am praying. And this guy will not give up on me. Finally, the judge again takes off his glasses, wipes his forehead, looks with resignation at the public defender and says, very well, we'll put him in drug diversion program. Wow. So it wasn't that I was at the edge of the abyss that time. I was dangling over it. You were <laughs> with a thread. <laughs> and I will tell you, that shaped me. That shaped my commitment, though. You mm -hmm. know, there's no way I'm going back into that life. First 12 years of my recovery were very, very difficult. Very difficult. Yeah. I was in such a sort of aggressive process of self-discovery. I needed answers as to why I couldn't fit in, you know, why I couldn't get it together. And that leads up to the therapist and, and her reframing the commune as a cult and the ideas I was exposed to as brainwashing, which were a huge turning point as well. And in fact, I would say that working with that therapist kind of started the final trajectory towards writing the book. And like you said, you have written a book about your struggles in your I life. I have, yes. Tell us, what, what do you hope to accomplish with this book? Now, that is a great question because there's, there's so much that I want for it. At the heart of it all, though, is to, is to be an example. The heart of it all is to really let people know in the most sort of non-abstract way possible that, hey, 
global change in your reality is possible. Because who I am today, where I am now, and what I've experienced, and actually the book writing process, weaving together that for the first time in my life, that cohesive emotional narrative that was true to me was the single biggest healing and transformational thing I've ever engaged in. Wow. And in fact, I'd go further than that, Stacy. I would say it was bigger. I couldn't have done it until I did some of the other things because I just wouldn't have been ready. Mm-hmm. But it was bigger than everything else combined. It created a complete change for me. I mean, I don't even recognize the guy I used to be. So did you learn more about yourself while you were writing? That's exactly what happened. Uh, We all sort of draw our self-image partly from what's called the social mirror. And that's the way that we interpret how other people treat us and react to us. Mm -hmm. We all draw our self-image partly from the family social mirror. That is usually much more powerful than the larger social mirror. And in my case, there was so much dissonance between the message I was getting from my family, which was all negative. The underlying fundamental message was negative. Mm, And it had been many years now that the rest of the world was giving me a very positive message. Because I had done a lot of work, you know, and I was really, I had become this other person. The paradox is, is that your family will typically sort of adjust to any progress you make the slowest. Because they have all the backlog of spending their whole lives with you. Right. (laughs) What it took for me was finally having to make a decision. Basically, I made a decision to consciously emotionally cut them out of my life it's not that they're they can't call me or come by but i switched over to this position internally of i no longer will allow myself to seek your approval to be affected by your opinions of me and things like that Mm -hmm. so in an emotional way i cut some ties with them right That was the real turning point that led right to writing the book and not an easy thing to do, by the way. No, I am not saying that what I did is for everyone, but I am saying that if you're making changes, if you're working on yourself, if you're committed to improvement and you still feel these sort of mysterious sticking points or you're still not getting support from those closest to you. It could be time to take a very hard, sober, sort of steely-eyed look at those relationships. Because what I will say is that any relationship that is toxic takes far more out of you than you're aware of. Sometimes you have to put them at arm's length, right? This is your life. It, it doesn't really matter that it started off in a certain group. It's your life. You decide with every single action if you're in charge of it or if you're letting someone else drive the car. And so it may not mean that you have to distance yourself from your family, but it's your life. Ultimately, everything comes back to you and your decisions. The goal then would be to be empowered to take control of your life. You know, I got to tell you that once I found my own writing voice, I couldn't stay away from the keyboard. It's exciting. Oh, so good. Well, Manny, this has been a lovely visit. I am so glad we came to know you a little bit more. Likewise, thank you so much for the time and the opportunity to tell my tale. Welcome to Stacy's Journal. In this segment, I let you peek into my journal as I share my thoughts on a topic or resilience resource. Today, let's talk about your origin story. As Manny's story shows, just because you're born into a bad situation, in his case, a cult, doesn't mean you have to drag that baggage with you the rest of your life. And it doesn't have to take coming face-to-face with an untraceable gun to have a moment of clarity. Changing yourself like Manny did is probably the hardest thing you'll ever do. In order to change, you have to get clear on where you are and where you've been. In other words, your origin story. How do you discover your origin story? Well, you start with your life theme. Think back to the milestones in your life and the desires you've had. Where do those intersect with some conflicts you've had? It might be beneficial to get those down in black and white. 
either on your computer or paper. Maybe spend some time reflecting back on your life. What or who has defined it? How have you made decisions in your life? And what or who influenced those decisions? Start writing that down. Those are the seeds of your origin story that you'll use to change your future. That's all we have for today. In the last episode, Kamala Chambers discussed writing about love found and lost. So if you've ever had to move on in any relationship, you might want to go back and have a listen. Next week, we'll interview Kathy Groover, who helps us conquer stress through writing. We love interacting with our listeners on social media. This week, check us out on Pinterest, Facebook, or just about anywhere you can hold a great virtual conversation. Before you go, don't forget to go and register for the upcoming webinar, Four Simple Proven Methods to Writing the First Chapter of Your Life Story in Just Seven Days. Head over to stacybrookman.com slash webinar for that. One more thing, we're doing something fun and counting down the 100 plus most important memoirs of the past 200 years. So our memoir of the day is Walden by Henry David Thoreau, written in 1854. Thoreau details his experiences over the course of two years, two months, and two days in a cabin he built near Walden Pond, Massachusetts, amidst woodland owned by his friend and mentor, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Here, he wrote his first book, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. In Walden, Thoreau compresses the time into a single calendar year and uses passages of four seasons to symbolize human development. Check out all the memoirs on this list at stacybrookman.com slash 100 memoirs, 100 memoirs. Remember, it's never too late to tell your story. 